Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the village. Good Sunday morning. Glad that you are with us. And uh, we have an exciting, uh, the message today is going to be one of the greatest you'll ever listen to. And so make sure you stick around. You're going to like it very, very much. Uh, I wanted to come on first just to give you a couple of announcements so you kind of know where we are in our process. This past week, an email should have been in your email box telling you about the evenings at mine and Jane's house where we're going to spend time talking to the Village Church about our reopening, which is September the 12th. And so if you did not get an email, then make sure you let us know. Write to info at thevillageatlanta.com, info at thevillageatlanta.com, or write to me, ray at raywaters.com. Let us know, because that means we must not have your email address. We are right now filling up the slots. We want to have at least 30, 40 people at our house Tuesday night, the 20th, or Thursday night, the 22nd. So choose one of those nights. You can go to our Village Facebook page and you will see both of those events listed. And then you choose one of those events and get your name on the list. We're going to have a dinner for you. And then we're going to just talk about church. We're going to talk about how excited we are. And it's going to be a great time for us to reconnect. So please put that on your calendar and do it today. Because here's what everybody does. And I get it. I do the same thing. I think, well, I don't know which day is going to be best. So I'll... I'm going to wait until the day before, and that really throws everything off. Go ahead and pick a day, put your name down, and plan to be with us. That would be fantastic. Then don't forget, September the 12th is when we are opening the village for the very first time uh, throughout all COVID. This will be the first service that we will have had there, and we are doing renovations even now. And I can't wait for you to be a part of that service. So make sure you circle that day and plan to be with us, okay? There are three ways you can give to support the love-focused, culture-changing, ever-evolving, community-building, Jesus-inspired work of the village. You can text the word GIVE to 404-998-8979, 404-998-8979, or you can give online at thevillageatlanta.com slash give, thevillageatlanta.com slash give, or you can mail a check to the Village Church, 3418 Dogwood Drive, Hapeville, Georgia, 30354. Now let's get ready to get better so that we can do better so that we can be better. Let's have church.
was born this way, I was born this way. Ooh, there ain't no other way, baby. I was born this way, I was born this way. Of 
God, I come, I come. Mm -hmm. Just as I am. Stan Mitchell is teaching today, and this message is one of those early messages that just gripped me. It just, it, it made me weep. It touched me in a deep place, and I'm so glad that he has chosen to teach on this topic today. Plan to listen closely, have a handkerchief handy, and I think it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful service and we're so glad that you have tuned in. Can I have a word of prayer for us? Okay. God, we thank you for this day. I thank you for every person that is watching, for whatever situations they're in in their life right now. We just pray that they would find you in the midst of it all, that they would know that you were there in the, in the innermost workings of everything. I thank you for the Village Church. I thank you for the wonderful people who support and help us be the church that you've called us to be. And I thank you for Stan Mitchell. I thank you for the gifts and talents he has and his willingness to share it with us. And I just pray that our hearts would be open and this message would speak to us. And I thank you for what it's going to do in our lives. And I pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, hello, my village family. Good to be back with you guys. Um, as a lot of you know, and some of you have asked uh, about me writing a book. Well, let me go to that book that I've been writing and am writing, a book whose publish, uh, publishing date is not yet known. That's a long story. But a book that's near and dear to my heart about this concept of shame, that if you know me at all, which you guys do, you know I talk about um, quite a lot. So... Let me do a reading. Let's see how good I would be if I were reading my own book on tape or on audio. Without question, Genesis' third chapter is one of the clearest descriptions ever written regarding the harrowing but holy journey of the human soul. If this is truly, as I think it is, a Christ-making world, if this is indeed a soul-making universe that we live in, we need guides to help us on our way. Thankfully, the text that I just referred to, Genesis, the third chapter, is just such a guide. In that chapter, the clear picture of who we are innately and dramatically collides with the nature of our deepest and most human temptations. This text, Genesis 3, we call it the story of the fall paints by my estimation a stunning picture of the brackish waters where our purest goodness mixes with our most vulnerable weaknesses. In Genesis 3's few but weighted first verses, the drama depicted there is of the universal sort. It is a story that has played out over and again in the life of every person who has ever lived or will ever live even a few years in this world. Here's the text. I'll read Genesis 3 for you a text both ancient and modern, a text that was theirs and is still ours. Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. And the serpent said to the woman, 
Did God say, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You don't even need to touch it or you will die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. You'll know good and evil. So then the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. And then she took of its fruit, ate, and also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Genesis 3, 1 through 7. No matter how many times I read that part of the creation fall story, I must admit I've never been able to make complete peace with it. It is the part of the story I most want to deny, the part I want to ignore, to gloss over, to clean up. And yet I know I dare not. For as is true of the entire story, that most unpleasant part must be faced. It must be taken seriously. It must be owned. Even this morning as I was reading again that classic story, it touched a very tender yet resonant chord in me. It simply has never gotten easier for me to watch the serpent in its insidious approach to the innocent and vulnerable Eve. As I read this morning, I still squirmed as I watched her struggling, stumbling, and finally, finally faulting fall into the serpent's gross deception. I watched her this morning again as she looked at the tree, saw it differently than she had ever seen it before, I watched her foolishly approaching, fatally touching, and tragically eating its lethal fruit. My heart broke this morning as it does every time. And I'm not the only one who has that type of experience with this text. I think thousands, millions, maybe even more have felt that same feeling, that unease. But the question is why? How does a 3,500-year-old story stir such contemporary emotion? Well, here's my take on that. Truth be told, the story gets to me, gets to us, because deep down we know the story of the fall is not just a cultural legend. We know it's not simply the historical recounting of some primordial human couple and their tragedy. We know deep down for sure that it's more than the archaeological recovery of the story of the first two homo sapiens. Now, don't misunderstand, I'm not proposing that it's less than any of those things. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm actually saying is the story is more than those things, so much more than any and all of that. And I think that's the reason it gets under my skin, because that is where the story has always been, under my skin, down in my bones, embedded in my soul. And I believe the same is true for you, true for all of us. There's no escaping the story, its truth, its discomfort, even if we wanted to, because that story, their story, is my story and your story. It's a story that doesn't live first in the past or in a book or in a particular religion's lore. Its primary home, rather, is in us. That story is a pivotal part of the human psyche, the human condition. And that is why it's in the Bible, not vice versa. In other words, things aren't true because the Bible says them. The Bible says them because they're true. Sacred literature is not voodoo. Sacred literature is sacred. Inspired texts don't operate by magic, nor do inspired texts demand allegiance. They don't have to. They don't have to bully with threats and fear. Inspired stories are inspired. Sacred stories are sacred because they earn our respect. They earn our respect by telling a story that is undeniably true and faithfully transformative. You see, that's what sacred books, that's specifically what sacred stories like Genesis 3 that encounter between a slithering, talking snake, that doolittle story between this woman and this snake and a primordial 
heavenly home, this perfect paradise called Eden. Sacred stories paint pictures that faithfully leave a missing part. Whether it's Native American, First Nations literature, Hindu literature, the literature of the Quran, the Tanakh, or Christian literature, sacred stories leave a missing part. And as we trace the outline of that missing piece in the inspired puzzle, we find it is the shape of our lives. That missing piece in the puzzle is the shape of our souls, our faces, our names. And this story, Genesis 3, is one of those truth stories. The image of Eve, as her heart and her countenance fell, as she heard the serpent and was convinced by the serpent that God had lied to her, that she was being played like a fool, that God did not truly care, nor could God be trusted. That picture of a falling, faltering woman is a picture that should never be pared down to just one person or one moment in history. That picture has been remade at some point in every human heart. That picture both demands and deserves to be recognized for what it is. The story of every human being ever born. And therefore, in that light, is one of the single most formative and transformative religious myths ever told. Now, I pause because I don't want to rush past that last sentence because I said that story from Scripture is one of the most profound religious myths ever told. And I know that word myth might stick in some of your throats like a chicken bone. But the reality is myth is not something that is untrue. Myth is something that is so irrepressibly true that it springs forth, it erupts from the soil of a thousand different cultures, a hundred different religions, dozens of different alphabets. When we talk about myth, as C.S. Lewis pointed out, as Joseph Campbell pointed out, and Houston Smith and other great religionists, myth is not something that is untrue. It's something that is transfactual. It's not less than fact, it's more than fact. Through the years, I have attempted to model Jesus' pedagogy, and I think the pedagogy, the teaching model of all sacred texts, this usage of myth. I've attempted to model that pedagogy with my own children, and I have recounted to them many of my family's legends. I've shared with my kids a lot of familial lore about uncles and aunts and grandparents and cousins. As I finish telling many of these stories to my kids, these incredulous two children of mine have not through the years infrequently asked, Dad, did that really happen? To which I have generally responded with some variation of, well, I'm not exactly sure, but I do know it's true. To that end, the story of the fall, for whatever else it may be, is above all true. It is the veritable spiritual biography of the entire human family. It is the standard a and anatomy and physiology text for the workings of the human soul. It is my story, your story, our story, no exceptions. To that end, through the years, I've been asked more times than I can count, do you take the Bible literally? I always respond somewhat tongue-in-cheek, and yet I think with a lot of conviction, absolutely not. I take the Bible way too seriously to ever take it literally. So as I read the story again this morning of the creation and fall, as I read the story of a talking snake and a woman wrestling with her identity and God's, I got to tell you, I take that story very seriously. And I'm left to not just say that it's hard for me to see Eve that way, but more aptly, it's hard for me to see in the story myself that way. It's hard for me to see you that way. Vulnerable, naked and not ashamed, pure, deceived, scared, broken, beautiful, and hiding. And so very wrong about so many things, about herself, about her husband, about life in general, and certainly about God. So very wrong. Well, remembering this important truth about sacred literature, I want to continue 
looking at that biblical, that primal story of Genesis 3, our story. And for just a bit, I want to see myself, you, in the garden, among the trees, wrestling with voices from within and without, dealing with forbidden fruits, fig leaves, and failure, hearing and reacting to the voices of both serpent and God, because that's the way we're called to read the sacred text. So then, it is with great respect that I refer to both our creation of false stories as religious myth, the, the truth story of the human soul. So let's go back to the garden now. Back to the place where Eve, made in the image of God, naked and not ashamed, encountered a serpent, and even more, a lie. A lie that would change her life forever. To Genesis 3, we now go Eden circa 2011 CE. Staring at her empty bed, I called her name down the hall. I was surprised when no answer came. She was strong-willed and had a mind of her own for sure. But this five-year-old of mine was never defiant. Another unanswered call or two turned my staring into glaring. A final appeal down the hall sent me huffing in search of my bedtime prodigal. It was well past time for her to be asleep. This was a big week. It was her first in kindergarten, and we were trying to keep the rules as tightly as possible. Just a few minutes earlier, I had sent her upstairs with a promise I would be right there to tuck her in and turn out the lights. It was obvious now she had veered off the path of her simple task and found something more important to do. After a bit of searching, I finally found her. Consistent with the vast history of parenting writ large, she, of course, was in the last place left for me to look. As I pulled back the curtain and peered into the dimly lit room, there she was. Strangely, I had found my little girl awkwardly standing in front of a full-length mirror in the small study slash den slash catch-all room we almost never went into. Before I could express my exasperation, I was struck by her posture, her body language before that mirror. Stoic still and staring at her reflection, there she was. The look on her little face more than caught my attention. It froze me, actually, and almost instantly drained me of any frustration I had been feeling. It was one part, this little face of hers, one part disappointment and another part confusion and a final piece embarrassment. In her few short years of life, I had never seen anything remotely similar to this in those sweet eyes. Frankly, at that moment, there was absolutely no way I could have known how significant a space this was for her or me. Looking back now, I know she wasn't just standing in our den that evening. She was standing at a threshold, this little girl of mine. One of those soul-altering, fork-in-the-road spaces we all get a few of in the course of our lives. Thankfully, in the moment, I understood enough to at least be able to slow my roll and approach her gently. I stood beside her for a bit, quietly staring at the same reflection she was. It occurs to me now that the vast difference in what the two of us saw as we looked at that same reflection of brown hair, chestnut eyes, and a slight four feet of human frame, the difference in what the two of us saw strikes at the heart of what this message is desperately trying to say. And never will I come closer to being God than I was that night standing beside my little Eve, at least the God in the story we read in Genesis 3. Finally, I broke the silence and asked simply if she was okay. I had to ask a second time, maybe a third, before she startled and realized I was talking to her. Sis, are you okay? After a long pause and with her eyes still locked on her reflection in the mirror, she whispered, Daddy, Daddy, am I fat? It will always amaze me how completely time can erase some things while indelibly imprinting others. That moment, that question, 
Those four words, even the temperature and lighting of the room are of the latter sort, imprinted. I will never forget the sound of her voice as it quivered and cracked, asking that question. It made the sound a voice makes when the heart that owns that voice is trying hard not to cry. It was as though somehow she felt she didn't deserve the tears, or perhaps she feared that if she released the first one, she might never stop crying. God, how helpless can a parent be? I just stood there wishing that it was the mirror, or for that matter, the damn cruel world outside that was breaking instead of her. But there we were, her tender heart breaking. What parent can't relate? This was one of those dastardly sacred moments when you realize that as poorly as you may have loved in your life, here was at least one person in the wide world that you indeed loved more than yourself. Here was one person in this wide world whose pain times 100 times 1 million, you would have gladly paid every penny you had to take. But you couldn't. You just have to be there. As a parent, you have to stand there frozen, sinking in the quicksand of inadequacy and dying a thousand deaths. You just stand there knowing that of the two million pounds of sadness pressing on those small, vulnerable shoulders, on that tiny frame with all of your trying, you could scarcely pull a pound or two off their crushed little heart. Am I fat? she asked. Knowing this was not a moment to rush into or an opportunity for Super Dad to come to the rescue, I paused, breathed a witless, wordless prayer, and slowly sat down on the floor at her side. Frankly, if I would have had shoes on, I would have removed them. I could sense, as awful as it was, this was obviously holy ground, the place of soul-breaking or soul-making or perhaps some of both. After thinking of a hundred things I wanted to say, I finally just said, No, sis, you aren't. You are perfect. You are beautiful. Unconvinced, she continued to stare at the mirror, her eyes barely remembering to blink. And then, after what seemed an hour was probably no more than 30 seconds, I again broke the silence. Who told you this? Who told you? this. I ask it with a clenched jaw, trying my hardest to not let my anger bleed through. I knew that somewhere in this world, a snake had slithered into her life and now slithered out. I knew somewhere there was a culprit, someone who was responsible for telling her that sordid lie. I knew it had not come from either her home or her heart. She whispered, I don't know his name. Her eyes now brimming completely full with tears, she whispered, I think he is in fifth grade. For a moment, I was intent on finding out who he was, who his parents were. I was intent on finding out who this was and letting him and them have a piece of my mind in exchange for the piece of her heart he had stolen. But as I sat there stewing in my anger and sadness, her pain did not allow me to stay sidetracked in my guilty displeasure for long. So for the moment, I suspended my pursuit of justice, took her hand and told her she was perfect and beautiful and that this boy was just being mean for reasons that neither she nor I could possibly understand. I told her that maybe someone had been mean to him and that often when people are hurt, they pass it on hurting other people. I told her his mean words said a lot about him and absolutely nothing about her. I stopped short of explaining to her that we should pray for him. Maybe later, I am very sure I was less ready at that moment than she would have been. As I continued prattling on, trying to fix things for my little girl, I finally came to my senses and realized my lesson in social psychology was not going to save the day. It was clear my best attempts to undermine her accuser's credibility were not going to make even the slightest dent in her pain. So thankfully that evening I relented, took off my amateur psychologist cap and put my dad cap back on and somehow mustered the good enough sense to close my mouth and instead open my arms. Remaining there in front of the mirror for a while, wrestling with our feelings, I just held her and as I did, I was freshly reminded of one of the immutable rules of parenting. 
the reality that while we can hold our children for a while, we can never hold on to them forever. With that understood, on that night, I held her as safely and as long and as tightly as I could while I contemplated every possible solution. Homeschooling, a visit with the bus driver, a visit with the school's principal, maybe a playground hitman. Okay, that, that possibility was a touch severe, I admit, but you get the point. We said a few more things, most of which I can't remember now, but mostly we were quiet. She was so small. It was so easy to hold her. And yet she was so large and complex. It was infinitely harder to hold a space for her and to not flood that space with a bull in a china closet effort to rescue her from something I could not possibly rescue her from. It was my weaning that was at a crossroads that day, at least as much as hers. After a while, she grew increasingly more peaceful. After a while, she left the mirror, finished getting ready for bed, and by the time I could brush my teeth, wash the tears off my cheeks, and get down the hall to tuck her in and say good night, she was already asleep. I remember looking at my little girl lying there in her bed. I remember wondering would her dreams on this night be sweet or bitter? Would she see his face or mine? Whose words would she hear? Whose opinion would she believe? Would she be dancing through Candyland or running scared through the dark forest in her dreams? As she went to sleep that night, I awoke to a scary realization. I sent her off to sleep. And that sending was much like sending her off to school. The places she would go now were beyond my control. I would simply have to wait nervously for her to come back to me, trusting, hoping, praying that whatever damage was inflicted somewhere between playgrounds and dreams, whatever damage was inflicted while she was away from me, upon her return, my love somehow would be able to undo. Someone wiser than I once said, and it's interesting that I'm recording this on Father's Day. Someone wiser than I once said that parenting is the decision a person makes to take their heart out of their chest and to allow it to go walking around in the world with scant protection. I've never felt that proposition more deeply than I did that night. For five years as her protector, I had kept her little life locked in the strong walls of my chest and in her own Garden of Eden, the place where she was naked and not ashamed, where the image of God she bore was unassailed and unquestioned. But now, the inevitability of life had expelled her from that place. Now she was towing the threshold of a new world. She was now going to have to find her way in the land east of Eden, a land in which she would be horribly and wonderfully free to have her heart both filled and broken. My God, how could one so small, so vulnerable survive? How do any of us, for crying out loud, survive this land? How do our hearts navigate the assaults and the wounds and the tears of things? By the way, as I close, I haven't forgotten that I told you we were going to continue the primal story, the story of the creation and fall. I told you we were going back to Genesis 3, didn't I? I meant that. And actually, that's what we just did. Again, the raw beauty and the transformative power of sacred literature is not in its historicity or scientific insights. A thousand times no. The fact is, these ancient narratives of ours do not simply recount the stories of legendary figures, but with far greater wisdom and impact, they tell the story of us all, even little five-year-old girls that a mean boy called fat. These stories tell the story of every human who's ever lived. They're not just the stories of fixed, gone by context of name, time, and place, but they are all our stories, timeless and without border. And so this is what I want to say about that 
There's so much more to say, but this is enough. A few years ago, standing before that mirror, one more person in this world was named Eve. On that night, when it was least expected, in the most innocuous of spaces, a cluttered little upstairs den became a garden called Eden. And just as the back wall of a wardrobe full of coats stored in the Lewis attic magically became the golden door to Narnia, for the 10 billionth time at least, the world began anew. Creation, innocence, competing voices, temptations, choices, shame, fig leaves, fear, hiding, and the hope of healing. As I looked at my sleeping child that night, it dawned on me that at the bus stop only a few hours or days before, I had not simply walked my little girl to the end of our driveway, but I had unwittingly escorted her to a location somewhere near the center of an Edenic garden of innocence. And as she carried herself and her little backpack up the stairs and down the aisle of that old school bus, we both thought she was just making her way to her assigned seat. Little did either of us know her true location that morning was a place in Eden that would soon be intersected by the serpentine path of a lie. And scarcely could a pre-adolescent fifth grade boy know on that morning he would play the role of the world's most famous reptilian antagonist. Nor could her bus driver have possibly known on that fateful morning he was much more than a county employee charged with getting her safely to school. He was a cherub. He was an angel appointed to guard Eden's entrance. And when she would walk past him for the second time that morning, heading down those rubber steps and onto the school parking lot, her soul would be different, profoundly changed from the one that had passed by him 20 minutes before. And little did she know as she walked down the stairs of that yellow bus, deboarding for one of her first days of school, the doors that folded closed behind her were actually the flaming swords of culture and self-consciousness, swords that would forever forbid that little girl's return to the place where she had been naked and not ashamed. And that little girl named Eve would take her journey with God and the biblical story, the human story, is a story of healing. A story of doing our dead level best somewhere between Genesis 1 and Revelation 22 in our life to putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. And if we can't get Humpty Dumpty back together again, then hoping and trusting in a resurrection that we can't possibly understand the anatomy of. So this was a story today about all of our journeys with those voices that play in our heads from billboards, from family members, from foe and friend. It was certainly a story about that and it's one that we can all relate to. And this was also a primer, a reminder of how beautiful sacred texts be and what is the purpose of religion in the world. Thank God that we have escaped fundamentalism and this terrible misuse of memorizing a text as if it were God. And we have found the beauty of sacred text, the beauty of religion. And in this, and in this, oh my, it seems best just to put my hand over my mouth and say enough with words. So, as Aslan the lion said to the broken-hearted Diggory, that little boy who had lost his mom, there's enough pain in this world. Let us be good to one another. And I think that would be enough for now. I love you, my village family. I mean it. You are a wonderful home for me. I love you, and I'll see you in a month or so. God bless you guys.
fill me up, God. Fill me up, God. Fill me up, God. Love of God overflow. Per me. Thank you.